That's right, 419. I was thinking that didn't look like 419 to the first part of uh, 5, five two a which is the first part of 5-2. There John makes the point that loving God and loving one another are inseparable. And we talked about that's right where we finished last week. He speaks of God's initiating love in chapter 4, verse 19. And in 420, he says that the, the true test of love or the, the, the test of true love for God is loving fellow Christians, loving the community of faith. And then in 421, he says that cr Christians are commanded by God to love one another. And then 5, 1 and verse 2, the first part of verse 2, he says that to love God is to love Christians because Christians are God's children and anyone who loves the Father loves the children of the Father. So that's his argument that he makes there. So in 419, in this section, 419 through 52a, he stresses that loving God and loving one another are inseparable. And then in 52b through 55, where I want to pick back up, he makes the point that loving God and obeying Him are inseparable. So it's just a broader thing. The idea of loving God and loving one another are inseparable, and loving God and obeying Him are inseparable, which is just a broader notion. Loving one another is one aspect of obeying God. Now he broadens that out here in 5, 2, B through 5. He says, we also do His commandments. You see, let me go back to the last one. He says, in this we know that we love the children of God when we love God. We also do His commandments. For this is love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome, because everyone having been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. But who is the one who overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So he says in, in 5, 2, second part, in the first part of, of verse 3, and I, let me say it makes more sense to me to begin a, a new sentence here with this last clause of verse 2, but I seem to be alone in thinking that. So I alert you to that. Uh, this makes sense to me, but most people you'd read don't, don't take this tack on it. So whenever I say something like that, that's a little flag for you to go, okay, I have to really be careful with what the guy's saying here. All right, but, but I think it makes more sense. It does to me. Now, not only do we know that we love God's children when we love God, that's what he said at the end there, at the end of, of uh, or in the first part of two, that we know we love, we love the children of God when we love God. We also obey his commandments when we love him. So when we love God, we love his children, and we also obey his commandments. And we do so because keeping his commandments is an essential aspect of loving God. See, we tend to pull those things apart and think of loving God in some kind of abstract sense, but these things are connected. You see, this notion of keeping his commandments is an essential aspect of loving God. See, that's why Jesus could say in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in our society and culture, that seems strange. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, what does that have to do with my loving you? I love you, but I don't say, no. But see, these things are, that's an essential aspect of loving God. John Stott, in his commentary, says, whether shown to God or to humans, agape is always practical and active. Love for your brothers and sisters expresses itself with actions and in truth, as John had said earlier, and especially in sacrificial service. Chapter 3, verse 7, 17 and 18. Love for God in carrying out His commands. So this is this thing. He says, so we also obey when we love God. And we do so because keeping His commandments is an essential aspect of of loving God. Then he says in the second part of verse 3 and in verse 4, he, sa he says there, and his commandments are not burdensome. You see, as, as I suspect the false teachers said or implied, you see that all this idea of doing this stuff and obeying somehow, because they say that's not really important, that's not really relevant. You don't have to care about what you do with your body here because this is all meaningless. 
And so why do you want to be under all of these rules and all that kind of stuff? So I suspect they're behind that. But, but he sits here, he says that his commandments are not burdensome because everyone born of God, which is John's audience, his addressees, everyone born of God conquers the world. Well, why aren't they burdensome? Because everyone born of God conquers the world. See, in the, you say, in what way does, does it conquer the world? Because the new birth creates an empowering new perspective. As you see in chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, let me read you what John Stott says. He says, the spell of the old life has been broken. The fascination of the world has lost its appeal. You see, obeying God for those born of God is no longer a chore. It's an expression of a grateful heart. See, so here, he, when he sits here, the commandments are not burdensome because everyone having been born of God overcomes the world in that we have this victory of this new perspective where we're not tied to the world. The old life has, has been broken, the spell, the fascination of the world has lost its appeal. We are different people. So we look at these things not as burdens but as an expression of gratitude. And then he says in 5.4, the second part of the verse, and, and, and 5.4, through 5.5, five, he identifies their faith as the means by which they've overcome the world. Right? He says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And then he specifies by this rhetorical question that the, that the nature of that faith, it is in distinction from the warped faith. You see, the warped faith of the false teachers. So it's no wonder that obedience strikes them as a burden. You see, he says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. But who's the one who overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God, unlike these people? You see, they don't have that empowering new perspective because they deny this fundamental tenet of the gospel. So they don't share in that victory, that perspective that helps us understand that his commands are not burdensome, that they are, they are something that is an expression of a grateful heart. So he says that, that, that there, you see, he distinguishes them. And then in five, chapter 5, verse 6 through 12, you have this testimony concerning the Son of God. And he says, this is the one who came with water and blood. Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in accord. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater because this is God's testimony that he has testified concerning his son. The one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar. For he has not believed in the testimony which God has testified concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. The one who has the son has the life. The one who does not have the son does not have the life. Now chapter 5 verse 6, this first part here where he says, this is the one who came with water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. Gary Burge, in his commentary, he says, 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 is perhaps the most perplexing verse in all the Johannine letters. So this is one scholar's assessment that this is, this is something. Raymond Brown, in his commentary, he describes the verse as enigmatic. And Colin Cruz, in his commentary, he says it's a very difficult verse to interpret. So when you have people of this caliber who have wrestled with this and they make these kinds of statements, that's a clue that one needs to tread lightly. Okay, when you, when you hear people like that saying that there's a lot going on here and there's a lot of uncertainty in how to, do, in how to understand this correctly, well, then you need some humility as you go into it and say, okay, now, you know, here's what I think, here's how I understand, but you take it and you have to take it and weigh it, okay? Now, I've thought, about, I've thought a lot about what I'm going to tell you, but that could be said for others, many people who've reached different conclusions. They, too, have thought about it a lot, okay? But I can't help but tell you how I understand it. So I'll explain it to you, what I think he's saying, 
you think about it and see if you think that I'm tracking and following correctly in what the Spirit of God is saying through John. First, you have to notice that you see the prepositions. I've taken the prepositions. There are two different prepositions in these two clauses. And I've taken both of these prepositions as denoting accompaniment rather than means. And so I've translated both of them as with. Now, both of the prepositions can have that meaning. You could look at any standard lexicon, theological dictionary. So Kenneth Grayson, he says in his commentary that the first clause of verse 6 means that Jesus Christ came by or with water and blood. Uh, David Rensberger says, how did Jesus come by or with these things? Okay, so there's that ambiguity in the prepositions, and I'm going with accompaniment. Okay, so I'm going with with. Now, John clearly, John clearly is taking issue as I see this. He's clearly taking issue with the false teacher's claim that Jesus came only with water and not with water and blood. Somebody's saying, look, he, he came with water, but not with water and blood. And John is taking issue with that notion that he came only with water and not with water and blood. John agrees that Jesus came with water, but he insists that contrary to the heretics, that he came not only with the water, but with the water and with the blood. See, so, yes, he came with water, but not only with the water. He came with the water and with the blood. So however one understands the meaning of coming with water and coming with blood, that understanding has to fit that framework. Okay, the framework that I'm telling you is that John sees there's an issue here. You have somebody claiming that he came with water, but not with water and with blood. And John says he came not only with water. Yeah, that's right, he came with water. But he came with water and with blood. That's, where I, that's how I see the issue. Okay, so that, that shapes then how I'm going to understand this. I think that's pretty clear. And so that then is, is something, you, it has to fit the framework. Whatever understanding we plug into this is to fit that framework. And what I think John is saying is that Jesus' effort to rescue mankind, his coming involved not only the baptism he instituted. It involved not only the baptism he instituted, but also, and centrally, it involved his atoning death. It involved not only the water, but also, and centrally, it involved the blood. Now, most scholars recognize that Jesus coming by or with water, that it refers in some way to baptism. Okay, that's not something, that's not some Church of Christ thing. You know, you say, oh, yeah, you're Church of Christ. You see baptism everywhere. All right, no, I mean, most scholars recognize there's some connection. You see, let me give you an example. David Rensberger says, in a Christian context, water must surely refer in some way to baptism. So it's not some kind of crazy idea. Most scholars recognize that there is, in some sense, a, a reference here to baptism, but most believe it refers to Jesus' baptism by John. That's where most would come and see it, okay? But with Colin Cruz... I consider it more likely that it refers to the baptism that Jesus instituted. And let me flesh that out. Well, why do I think that? Why do I think it's more likely that it refers to the baptism that Jesus instituted rather than Jesus having been baptized by John? Well, the phrase, with water, that's used three times in the Gospel of John in reference to John the Baptist's baptizing ministry and most tellingly in John chapter 1 verse 31 John reports the statement of John the Baptist that he came baptizing with water and see I don't think that it's a stretch to believe the apostles statement in first John chapter 5 verse 6 that Jesus came with the water is a shortened reference to the same concept that Jesus came baptizing with water you see, John certainly was aware that Jesus instituted a water baptism. He refers to Jesus' baptizing ministry in a number of places. John chapter 3, verses 22 through 26. John chapter 4, verse 1. 
Though, as you know, Jesus entrusted the actual baptizing of people to his disciples. You see that in John chapter 4, verse 2. So the contrast that John the Baptist draws between his baptizing with water and Jesus baptizing with the Spirit. You know, he makes that distinction. I baptize with water and when coming out, I baptize with the Spirit. Now that contrast that he makes in John 1, 26 to 33 it doesn't negate the fact that Jesus instituted a water baptism. John is clear in the verses I just referred to that Jesus did institute a water baptism. Not to mention what's said in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 and what's said about Christian baptism throughout the rest of the New Testament. So you know, the fact what John says, I baptize in water, but he, you, you can't say that Jesus' baptism, he didn't institute a water baptism because John said, I baptize in water, but he didn't become baptized in the Spirit. Because it's clear Jesus instituted a water baptism. Rather, Jesus now baptizes with the Spirit in conjunction with the water baptism he instituted. That's the birth of water and Spirit. You see that that's referred to in John chapter 3, verse 5. Here's what Martin C. DeBoer in a 1988 article in the Journal of Biblical Literature. He says, unlike the baptism of that other baptizer, John, his baptism, Jesus' baptism with water, was also baptism with the Holy Spirit. You see, it occurs in conjunction with. It's not like, well, he didn't institute a water baptism. Say, How can you say that and read what John says? How can you say that and read the rest of the New Testament? He instituted a water baptism, but the spirit baptism is associated with that water baptism. Colin Cruz, he says, Jesus once baptized with water, but now baptizes with the spirit. And it has been suggested that those in the author's community understood that Jesus now baptized people with the spirit when they baptized them with water in Jesus' name. And I think that's right. And don't we say that? I baptize you now in the name of the Father. You, you, you know, your sins will be forgiven. You receive what? You receive the gift of the Spirit. See, there's the, 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 they, are, they occur in conjunction. These, this gift of the Spirit is connected and associated with baptism in water. So these things are leading me to say, listen, I think Cruz, uh, Colin Cruz is right. When it's more likely that when he says he this came with water, that it's referring to the water of the baptism that Jesus instituted. But perhaps most importantly in that regard is the statement that Jesus, when he says Jesus came with blood, okay, when he says Jesus came with blood, that clearly refers to his giving his life in sacrifice for the sins of mankind. You see, that's the meaning of blood. And the only other reference to blood that we have in 1 John outside of this immediate context. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, he says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us of all sin. You see, so it's this idea of his giving his life in sacrificial uh, atonement. That's what he's talking about. And since his coming with blood refers to something that he did, right, rather than something that was done to him? If his coming with blood is in fact a reference to his giving his life in sacrifice for us, then it's a reference to something he did rather than a reference to something that was done to him. He laid down his life for us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. You can look in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. So if that's right, then the parallel of his coming with water is better understood as something he did, instituted a baptism, rather than something done to him was baptized by John. Okay, so I, I'm thinking it's more like this, that this reference to water and this reference to blood is a reference to the baptism he instituted and to his laying down his life as an atonement for our sins. That's the water and that's the blood. And we know that at least some second century Gnostics, who know at least some of them considered baptism to be very important. You remember that John here is dealing with what's probably like a proto-Gnosticism, not a fully developed Gnosticism. That's, that's generally thought to be a creature of the second century. We're in the late first century. 
but there seem to be a lot of commonalities and, and things in, in the heresy that these guys are, are presenting. And so when we look at, well, how did Gnostics in the second century view baptism? And of course, there's a great variation. But here's what uh, John Harris says in his book, Gnosticism, Beliefs, and Practices. He says, as far as the meaning of baptism goes, the Gnostics seem to regard it as a rite of purification or of cleansing and preparation for admission to the Pleroma, the ultimate realm of the true God. It also had an element of initiation into the mysteries of Gnosis, knowledge. The Valentinians viewed baptism, that's one of the groups of Gnostics, the Valentinians viewed baptism as a redemption rite, and both they and the Sethian Gnostics regarded baptism as the assurance of immortality. Through baptism, the baptized received the spirit of immortality, and thereby the baptized became a pneumatic spiritual being. This was equivalent to receiving the immortal spirit of Christ. So it's not unreasonable to think that John's opponents in 1 John that they combined a Gnostic-like Christology. Okay, remember I've talked about, you know, their ideas about God the Son didn't actually become the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. You see, whether he only seemed to be or whether he temporarily inhabited him, you see, they have a very fundamental Christological error. So it's not unreasonable to think that they combined that false Gnostic-like Christology with an emphasis on the baptism instituted by Christ. So whereas they were down with the importance and idea that, yes, there's something significant going here, and they said he came with water, John says, well, he did come with water. But what you're missing is that he also came with the blood. That's what you're missing. He came not only with the water, he also came with with the blood. See, so John agrees with the false teachers that Jesus came baptizing and that one's submission to that baptism is a pivotal spiritual event. However, they may disagree about the particulars of the baptism's significance. But you have Gnostics who reasonably, these proto-Gnostics, John's opponents, it's reasonable to me to think that they recognized or believed that Jesus came instituting a baptism that had some spiritual significance. And John says, okay, yes, he came instituting a baptism, and yes, his baptism is a pivotal spiritual event, but he rejects the notions that the blessings received at baptism can be separated from Christ's death on the cross. You see, they are inextricably linked. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came not only with the water, but he came with the water and with the blood. As I've, as I've mentioned, you, know, you, you have these false teachers who in, that, in some sense they denied that. They had this warped Christology, as I just said. So they're saying, well, no, no, God's not dying on that cross. That's crazy talk. That God actually became a human being in this lowly material world that is so contrary to the high spirit realm, this world is nothing. And that he actually became flesh and then died? You see, so they rejected that. So with this docetism, he only seemed to be, or there was this temporary inhabitation. See, it was only the man Jesus who suffered on the, on the cross. It was not God incarnate. It was not God in the flesh who suffered and died on that cross. Well, that denial, you see, that the eternal God, that the eternal God died on the cross as the man Jesus of Nazareth, that eviscerated the gospel. By denying that, they eviscerated the gospel by eliminating the atonement. And therefore, they eliminated the blessings associated with baptism. They have created a separation. They've left you with baptism that has nothing to undergird it. They have, they have taken the atoning death of Christ out and then still talk about the pivotal spiritual event of his baptism. Well, if you've taken that away, then what you're preaching is a theological fraud. You're 
claiming that there's something here that happens here and you've taken the basis of that happening away. And so I think that's what he's driving at, you see. I think that's what, he, what he's telling him. That your denial of Christ's atoning death that you're promoting, that you're creating this split by still recognizing something of spiritual value and happening in the baptism he instituted, but by denying that God died on that cross. You have removed the theological basis for there being anything associated with baptism. That is the basis of all forgiveness, that atoning death. Okay, in the second part of 6, he says, and the Spirit is the one who testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. See, the Spirit is the one who testifies to this truth that John is talking about, to this truth that God the Son, God became the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, and suffered this atoning death on the cross that cannot be pulled apart, cannot be denied. And so he says here, the Spirit is the one who testifies to this truth in and through the apostolic witness. That is the Spirit testifying that this is the truth of the matter, is that God became human and died on that cross. Most, it's, it's, the Spirit testifies through the apostolic witness most immediately through John and what John is writing and what he says can be trusted because the Spirit is God's truth. You see, he speaks the truth of God. And so John is, uh, John is letting them know. Then he says in verses 7 and 8, For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in accord. So you not only have the Spirit through the apostolic witness in the church, through most immediately now through John, you not only have that testimony, you have three of them. You have the Spirit, the water, and the blood testifying, and they're all on the same page. They're all saying the same truth, which is, of course, something that's necessary in the law. The witnesses have to agree. You see, so he says you have three that testify. You've got the Spirit, you've got the water, and you've got the blood. Now, I suspect what John means is that the Spirit testifies to this truth through the message of the apostles, that is preached in the church and, and now repeated by John, and the water of baptism and the blood that was shed on the cross, they bear silent testimony to the same truth. You see this idea, you've got the, you, he comes with water and blood, so you have the Spirit testifying to that truth, you have the water of baptism with which we're all familiar testifying to that truth, and you have the blood that poured out on the cross testifying to that truth. Whether or not they accept it, it bears silent witness, and it is a fact that that blood came from God the Son. And so there it sits as this silent witness bearing testimony to the truth that John is saying he came, yes, with water, but also as God incarnate and died on that cross. This is gospel stuff. And that blood sits there and bears silent testimony to it. It did, in fact, flow from the veins of Christ. It wasn't an appearance. It wasn't a temporary thing that only the man Jesus suffered on the cross. That blood that is there calls out in witness that it was the blood of God the Son. Now, if you have a King James or a new King James... You'll see there's some additional words here at the end of verse 7 and the beginning of verse 8. And here I've highlighted those there for you. And it's universally recognized that that's not part of the original text. Okay, that is a later addition into 1 John that crept in there much later. And you say, well, why did the King James Version work off of that? Well, that was the manuscripts that they had to work from. Let me read to you what Colin Cruz, this is just a footnote, by the way. I did, you, sometimes when you run across things, you say, well, why does the King James say this? Put this over the footnote, and I just like to point these things out. Colin Cruz says, this longer version known as the Johannine comma, comma meaning sentence, is preserved only in a few later Greek manuscripts dating from the 10th to the 18th centuries. 
It is thought that the Johannine comma found its way into the Greek manuscripts via the Latin manuscripts of the 9th century. The Johannine comma is found in no early Greek manuscripts and is not found in the old Latin versions before the 7th century, nor in the Vulgate before the 8th century. It is correctly omitted from all modern translations of the New Testament. David Rensberger says, Unfortunately, the added words were incorporated into the Greek text commonly printed from the 16th century. So when you had the translators, they had, well, what text do we work off of? What they had access to was what was printed then, so they took an inferior Greek text that we now know to be inferior. And they wound up looking at these and incorporating it. So that's how that got in there. And then once something gets in there in terms of Bible, it doesn't matter how strong the case is that it shouldn't have been in there in the first place. People are loath to mess with it. You see? So what you probably, you, a lot of times you'll still have these things. Footnote, earliest manuscripts don't have this in there. But we don't want to upset you and have you not buy our Bible. So we're putting it in there. <laughs> All right, so that, I mean, that's, he goes on, he says, Commonly printed from the 60s until, until the rise of modern critical editions of Textus Receptus, and so uh, were also included in the King James Version. All right, so that's really, as I say, that's just a footnote for the curious. Verse 9, he says, If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater because this is God's testimony that he's testified concerning his son. We accept human testimony. We accept it all the time. All kinds of ways, shapes, and forms. We accept that, right? But surely God's testimony by the Spirit is more compelling because it's God's testimony. You're going to take the testimony of people, then certainly you've got to take the testimony of God. Coming through the Spirit, coming through the apostolic witness, coming through what John is saying. You're going to take the testimony of men, which we do. Well, then you're going to take the testimony of God. Surely His testimony is more compelling because it's His testimony it's testimony he has given about his son. So remember, John is what? He's, trying, he's calling these people out who are presenting this false gospel. And he's saying they are ripping apart. They are, they, in their false Christology, they are eviscerating the gospel. This isn't small potatoes. This isn't, is it okay to wear jeans to church? This is serious stuff. You see, this, this is heart gospel stuff. And so he's saying, you believe people, well, you're going to need to believe God because God is putting it out there. And then he says in verse 10, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar for he's not believed in the testimony which God has testified concerning his Son. The person who believes in the Son of God, meaning believe, believes that Jesus was the divine Christ. He didn't just seem to be he wasn't simply temporarily inhabited. He is God incarnate. See, he's God in the flesh. He's not like any of these other religious teachers. He's not like, well, you know, he was pretty deep. Yeah, but you know, I like Gandhi. He's not like that. Buddha or any, you know, you pick him. He's God in, he's God in the flesh. And the person who believes in the Son of God, meaning believes in that way, in that sense, believes that Jesus was the divine Christ, he has this testimony in himself, in his heart, the testimony that the Christ died. See, no, nobody questioned that Jesus died, but they have in them because they understand that Jesus is God incarnate, they have this testimony in themselves that the Christ died. You see, that, that was God on the cross. As mind-blowing as that is. That was God on the cross, and they have that testimony. Those who don't believe God's testimony about his, his son have made God out to be a liar. So God testifies through the Spirit and says, this is the truth. And you got people telling you, that's not true. That's not right. And he says, what is that? This is the truth of God. He says in verse 11 and 12, and this is the testimony that God gave us, and this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has the life, and the one who does not have the Son does not have the life. The testimony God has given about his Son 
is that God gave us eternal life in Him through His atoning sacrifice. See, that's where, that's where the life is. It is through the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is by the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. That is the pivotal point of history. Everything pivots on the cross of Jesus from creation to eternity. That is the point. That death of Jesus on that cross. And so he, he says, look, the testimony God has given about his son is that God gave us eternal life in him. And the one who has the Son of God, meaning the one who accepts the truth that Jesus who died was the Son of God. The one who embraces that truth. The one who doesn't skirt it with this Gnostic nonsense and say, no, that's crazy. God didn't die on that cross. That wasn't God incarnate suffering and enduring. Well, the one who has that testimony has God. He has life. And the one who does not have the Son in that sense does not have life. Meaning these teachers, most immediately. Of course, all of this has implications for us and you know, for the church throughout the ages. But most immediately, see, he's saying these people over here, in their denial of this very fundamental thing, I want you to understand how serious this is. As he's made the point throughout how serious it is. But this is what he's talking about. Then we get to the conclusion, and I hear that cheer, the conclusion but we're going to have to finish. We're going to finish 1 John uh, next week, and we might get into 2 John. I don't know how that flies with uh, Bernard's recording. But when I finish, if I finish 1 John in 15 minutes the next week, we're just starting with 2 John. And then I've got 2 John and 3 John, which, as you know, are very small. And when I finish those, we'll then begin archaeology in the Bible. All right, so that's the game plan. But he says here in 513, the conclusion is 513 down through 21. There's quite a bit to to wrestle with here. He says, I write these things to you, the ones believing in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, John summarizes his purpose in writing. Remember, just as he does in the Gospel of John, in chapter 20, verse 31, I write these things to you so that you may believe. You see, so here he summarizes his purpose in writing, and he wants his readers to know that contrary to whatever suggestions the false teachers may have made, and I've told you this many times, how, what do the false teachers do? They first, they begin by making you insecure about your standing with God. And see, that is a way for them to get an audience with you. Because if I can disturb your peace with God, you now are interested in me as the purveyor of peace with God. See, I have to disrupt that. So then you might be interested in what I have to say because you're now in a state of anxiety and what I'm marketing will relieve that. So he, you know, he, he says here, look, he wants them to know that contrary to whatever suggestions these false teachers may have made, that they have eternal life. They're not to allow these self-proclaimed spiritual heavyweights to rob them of their peace and security. And that is a message the church needs to hear. The church needs to be at peace. John has said an awful lot about people who aren't really uh, walking in the light, who don't really have faith, who are spiritual frauds. We know all that, but we're not talking about people like that. We're talking about you and me, people who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who in that commitment imperfectly limp along. We need to be at peace. No anxiety. No sense of, oh, no, no, you know, God's right. As though God is sitting here saying to me, out. I'm just looking for you to mess up so I can kick you out. That is a crazy view of God. Crazy wrong. Okay? So this idea, he wants them to be at peace. So they can just relax and not be spiritual neurotics. They can be at peace in that. And then he assures them regarding prayer. In 5, 14, 14 to 15, he says, And this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we've asked from him. See, being in Christ, as he's telling him, I, I want to assure you, you're, you're right. I want you to be at peace. Well, being in Christ, being children of God, 
they can be bold in approaching God as a child with a parent. You see, I mean, a child, you know, if there's a healthy relationship, I always have to foot, no, I understand this is a fallen, broken world and that there are parental-child relationships that are wrong. But I'm talking about in a normal parent-child relationship. A child doesn't come to a parent with requests and, you know, like this, I don't know, I can't, I can't. Why? He probably beat me to death. Although I, John and I did know a kid like that who was so terrified of his father when we were growing up. But see, so what? There's a confidence. Why? The confidence is in the relationship that that's my dad. Yeah. Right? So this is this idea, what he's saying. Being children of God, they can be bold in approaching God and confident that he will favorably hear whatever they ask according to his will. Ah. You see, that's the thing. That, you know, well, that's true of parents too, Right? Your kid comes up and says, hey, I want to buy the, I want to buy the bubble gum store. I want to go in there and, you know, ask, spend 50 bucks in the buy. I heard that bell. Well, what are you going to say? Well, no. Is it because you don't love them? No. It's because you're a parent and you've got a much bigger sight of what's really good for them. Okay? So there are things, see, that are not in God's will that you may petition and ask, and it'll be not now or it'll be no because you don't know what you're asking. But within that will, we are bold, and there's some other things I'll talk about next week. Heard the bell. Thanks for coming.